Chapter 3, Part 2 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Services of Santos Dumont, Part 2. The later balloon, number six, with which Santos Dumont won the Deutsch Prize, may fairly be taken as his conception of the finished type of dirigible for one man. In fact, his aspirations never soared as high as those of Count Zeppelin, and the largest airship he ever planned, called the Omnibus, carried only four men. It is probable that the diversion of his interest from dirigibles to airplanes had most to do with his failure to carry his development further than he did. Number six was 108 feet long and 20 feet in diameter with an 18 horsepower gasoline engine which could drive it at about 19 miles an hour. Naturally, the aeronaut's first thought in his new construction was of the valves. The memory of the anxious minutes spent perched on the window sill of the Trocadero Hotel or dangling like a spider at the end of the fireman's rope were still fresh. The balloonette which had failed him in number five was perfected in its successor. Notwithstanding the care with which she was constructed, the prize winner turned out to be a rather unlucky ship. On her trial voyage, she ran into a tree and was damaged, and even on the day of her greatest conquest, she behaved badly. The test was made on October 1, 1901. The aeronaut had rounded the tower finely and was making for home when the motor began to miss and threatened to stop altogether. While Santos Dumont was tinkering with the engine, leaving the steering wheel to itself, the balloon drifted over the Bois de Boulogne. As usual, the cool air from the wood caused the hydrogen in the balloon to contract, and the craft dropped until it appeared the voyage would end in the treetops. Hastily shifting his weights, the aeronaut forced the prow of the ship upwards to a sharp angle with the earth. Just at this moment, the reluctant engine started up again with such vigor that for a moment the ship threatened to assume a perpendicular position, pointing straight up in the sky. A cry went up from the spectators below, who feared a dire catastrophe was about to end a voyage which promised success. But with incomparable sang-froid, the young Brazilian manipulated the weights restored the ship to the horizontal again without stopping the engines, and reached the finishing stake in time to win the prize. Soon after it was awarded him, the Brazilian government presented him with another substantial prize, together with a gold medal bearing the words, Por seos nunca de antes navegados, through heavens hitherto unsailed. In a sense, the reference to the heavens is a trifle over-rhetorical. Santos Dumont differed from all aviators, or pilots of airplanes, and most navigators of dirigibles in always advocating the strategy of staying near the ground. In his flights, he barely topped the roofs of the houses, and in his writings he repeatedly refers to the sense of safety that came to him when he knew he was close to the treetops of a forest. This may have been due to the fact that in his very first flight in a dirigible, he narrowly escaped a fatal accident due to flying too high. As he descended, the gas which had expanded now contracted. The balloon began to collapse in the middle. Cords subjected to unusual stress began to snap. The air pump, which should have pumped the ballonet full of air to keep the balloon rigid, failed to work. Seeing that he was about to fall into a field in which his drag rope was already trailing, the imperiled airman had a happy thought. Some boys were there flying kites. He shouted to them to seize his rope and run against the wind. The balloon responded to the new force like a kite. The rapidity of its fall was checked, and its pilot landed with only a serious shaking. But thereafter, Santos Dumont preached the maxim, rare among airmen, keep near the ground, that way lie safety. Most aviators, however, prefer the heights of the atmosphere, as a sailor prefers the wide and open sea to a course near land. After winning the Deutsch Prize, Santos Dumont continued for a time to amuse himself with dirigibles. I say amuse purposely, for never did serious aeronaut get so much fun out of a rather perilous pastime as he. In his number nine, he built the smallest dirigible ever known. The balloon had just power enough to raise her pilot and 66 pounds more beside a three-horsepower motor. 
but she attained a speed of twelve miles an hour, was readily handled, and it was her owner's dearest delight to use her for a taxicab, calling for lunch at the cafés in the Bois, and paying visits to friends upon whom he looked in, literally, at their second-story windows. He ran her in and out of her hangar as one would a motor-car from its garage. One day he sailed down the Avenue des Champs-Élysées at the level of the second and third story windows of the palaces that lined that stately street. Coming to his own house, he descended, made fast, and went in to Dejeuner, leaving his aerial cab without. In the city streets he steered mainly by aid of a guide rope trailing behind him. With this he turned sharp corners went around the Arc de Triomphe, and said, I might have guide-roped under it had I thought myself worthy. On occasion he picked up children in the streets and gave them a ride. Though before losing his interest in dirigibles, Santos Dumont carried the number of his construction up to ten. He cannot be said to have devised any new and useful improvements after his number six. The largest of his ships was number ten, which had a capacity of eighty thousand cubic feet, about ten times the size of the little runabout with which he played pranks in paris streets in this balloon he placed partitions to prevent the gas shifting to one part of the envelope and to guard against losing it all in the event of a tear the same principle was fundamental in count zeppelin's airships in nineteen o four he brought a dirigible to the united states expecting to compete for a prize at the st louis exposition but while suffering exasperating delay from the red tape which enveloped the exposition authorities, he discovered one morning that his craft had been mutilated almost beyond repair in its storage place. In high dudgeon, he left at once for Paris. The explanation of the malicious act has never been made clear, though many Americans had an uneasy feeling that the gallant and sportsmanlike Brazilian had been badly treated in our land. On his return to Paris, he at once began experimenting with heavier-than-air machines. Of his work with them, we shall give some account later. Despite his great personal popularity, the airship built by Santos Dumont never appealed to the French military authorities. Probably this was largely due to the fact that he never built one of a sufficient size to meet military tests. The amateur in him was unconquerable. While von Zeppelin's first ship was big enough to take the air in actual war, the Frenchman went on building craft for one or two men. Good models for others to seize and build upon, but nothing which a war office could actually adopt. But he served his country well by stimulating the creation of great companies who built largely upon the foundations he had laid. First and greatest of these was the company formed by the Libaldi brothers, wealthy sugar manufacturers. Their model was semi-rigid, that is, provided with an inflexible keel or floor to the gas bag, which was cigar-shaped. The most successful of the earlier ships was 190 feet long, with a car suspended by cables 10 feet below the balloon and carrying the twin motors, together with passengers and supplies. Although it made many voyages without accident, it finally encountered what seems to be the chief peril of dirigible balloons, being torn from its moorings at Chalons and dashed against trees to the complete demolition of its envelope. Repaired in eleven weeks, she was taken over by the French Department of War and was in active service at the beginning of the war. Her two successors on the company's building ways were less fortunate. La Patrie, after many successful trips and maneuvers with the troops, was insecurely moored at Verdun, the famous fortress where she was to have been permanently stationed. Came up a heavy gale. Her anchors began to drag. The bugle sounded, and the soldiers by hundreds rushed from the fort to aid. Hurled along by the wind, she dragged the soldiers after her. Fearing disaster to the men, the commandant reluctantly ordered them to let go. The ship leaped into the black upper air and disappeared. All across France, across that very country where in 1916 the trenches cut their ugly zigzags from the channel to the Vosges, she drifted unseen. By morning she was flying over England and Wales. Ireland caught a glimpse of her, and days thereafter sailors coming into port told of a curious yellow mass, seemingly flabby and disintegrating like the carcass of a whale, floating far out at sea. 
her partnership la republique had a like tragic end she too made many successful trips and proved her stability and worth but one day while maneuvering near paris one of her propellers broke and tore a great rent in her envelope as a titanic her hull ripped open by an iceberg sunk with more than a thousand of her people so this airship wounded in a more unstable element fell to the ground killing all on board two airships were built in france for england in nineteen o nine one the clement bayard the second was of the rigid type and built for the government the other a le body was non rigid and paid for by popular subscriptions raised by england by the morning post both were safely delivered near London, having made their voyages of approximately 242 miles, each at a speed exceeding 40 miles an hour. These were the first airships acquired for British use. In the United States, the only serious effort to develop the dirigible prior to the war, and to apply it to some definite purpose, was made not by the government, but by an individual, Mr. Walter Wellman a distinguished journalist, fired by the effort of André to reach the North Pole in a drifting balloon, undertook a similar expedition with a dirigible in 1907. A balloon was built 184 feet in length and 52 feet in diameter, and was driven by a 70 to 80 horsepower motor. A curious feature of this craft was the guide rope, or as Wellman called it, the equilibrator, which was made of steel, jointed and hollow at the lower end were four steel cylinders carrying wheels and so arranged that they would float on water or trundle along over the roughest ice the idea was that the equilibrator would serve like a guide rope trailing on the water or ice when the balloon hung low and increasing the power of its drag if the balloon rising higher lifted a greater part of its length into the air Wellman had every possible appliance to contribute to the safety of the airship, and many believe that had fortune favored him, the glory of the discovery of the pole would have been his. Unhappily, he encountered only ill luck. One reason he spent at Danes Island near Spitzenberg, whence André had set sail, waiting vainly for favorable weather conditions. The following summer, just as he was about to start, a fierce storm destroyed his balloon shed and injured the balloon. Before necessary repairs could be accomplished, Admiral Perry discovered the pole, and the purpose of the expedition was at an end. Wellman, however, had become deeply interested in aeronautics, and, balked in one ambition, set out to accomplish another. With the same balloon, somewhat remodeled, he tried to cross the Atlantic, setting sail from Atlantic City, New Jersey, October 16, 1911. But the device on which the aeronaut most prided himself proved his undoing. The equilibrator relied upon both for storage room and, as a regulator of the altitude of the ship, proved a fatal attachment. In even moderate weather, it bumped over the waves and racked the structure of the balloon with its savage tugging until the machinery broke down and the adventurers were at the mercy of the elements. Luckily for them, after they had been adrift for 72 hours and traveled several hundred miles, they were rescued by the British steamer Trent. Not long after Wellman's chief engineer, Vanneman sought to cross the Atlantic in a similar craft, but from some unexplained cause, she blew up in mid-air and all aboard were lost. Neither Great Britain nor the United States has reason to be proud of the attitude of its government towards the inventors who were struggling to subdue the air to the uses of man. Nor has either reason to boast much of its action in utterly ignoring, up to the very day war broke, that aid to military service of which Lord Kitchener said, one aviator is worth a corps of cavalry. It will be noted that to get its first effective dirigible, Great Britain had to rely upon popular subscriptions drummed up by a newspaper. That was in 1909. Today, in 1917, the United States has only one dirigible of a type to be considered effective in the light of modern standards, though our entrance upon the war has caused the beginning of a considerable fleet. In aviation, no less than in aerostatics, the record of the United States is negligible. Our country did indeed produce the Wright brothers, pioneers and true conquerors of the air with airplanes but even they were forced to go to france for support and indeed for respectful attention
So far as the development of dirigible balloons is concerned, there is no more need to devote space to what was done in England and the United States than there was for the famous chapter on snakes in Iceland. End of The Services of Santos Dumont, Part 2 Recording by William Tomko